How are you doing, Richard? Yeah, good, and you? Yeah, not bad, thank you. Um, I'm going to get started because I haven't got too long, obviously. Uh, obviously, we're speaking about dispatches, so I was just wondering um, what it was that initially sort of attracted you to getting involved in this, in this project and to this character. Uh, Jason Siegel and uh, Sally Field were the two, obviously, they're the two hooks because they're the people that I knew and recognised. I'd never seen um, Andre 3000 um, do acting. Obviously, I knew his music, um, and he's an amazing actor. And Eve Lindley was somebody that was completely unknown to me, and she's extraordinary. Um, so I met when I was in the sort of Oscar run-up um, this time last year. Uh, Jason Siegel asked to meet me at the hotel that I was staying in and pitched me the story for about an hour and a half. So there are only four episodes written, and it would be a leap of faith taking it. And I played this guy who, you know, is a sort of like the equivalent of the head of Scientology. So I watched, I watched the Scientology documentary and the documentary that this um, inspired this show called The Institute about this cult that um, occurred in San Francisco 10 years ago. And so it's a combination of those two things and the guy in the, in the documentary called The Institute was called Octavia. So it was pretty obvious, you know, look down the lens, don't blink and just gab, gab away. So, you know, it was a leap of faith and we uh, took it, having no idea how the thing was going to end or what actually happened. Then I realized after four episodes and Sally Field had the exact same thing that what you think you're playing and what you think the thing is about is not what it's about. So um, this is a magical mystery tour. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of a fascinating process, really, because I guess with any movie, you, you'll take a script, you'll read your character, and you know their entire trajectory. You know how their beginning, middle, and end is. So exactly. Was, I guess, was it quite challenging to, to, to learn how to play the character and to get into the character's head, not knowing how the character would eventually grow and, and what he would be capable of by the end of play? Well, I think, yes, that, that, that is the leap of faith that you take. But, you know, Jason is a really smart guy. Um, and he's very, very persuasive and incredibly articulate. And I suppose somebody told me, I've never worked for Woody Allen, but that he would only give actors a script, only the pages that they had. So they had no idea who the other people were, you know, as in real life, you have you know, no idea who's coming around the corner. Mm. So you can't preempt anything. So playing just what you have in front of you is, means that you can only be in the moment of doing that and that's that in itself is quite liberating because you don't have to think well what has this character said about this character or you know what am i supposed to be thinking here or whatever you can only do what you know literally is in front of you and you mentioned uh, Andre Benjamin. I mean, I'm a huge Outcast fan. And I mean, I'm so I, Andre 3000 is like a bit of an enigma to me. I've always been fascinated to know what he's like. So my question is really, what's Andre 3000 like? He plays his electric flute all day long. You could, you could, you walk into the studio and uh, between every take, you would instantly hear him um, in the car going to work in the morning. You would, he, he would play it. So whether that was a way of avoiding conversation or starting conversation, I don't know. Or whether he kept him in, him in a meditative state or just because he's, you know, he's intrinsically a musician from top to toe. Um, he played that electric flute in a kind not, not even tunes. It would be like almost ambient, ambient background sound, but that, that's what he did all the time. <laughs> I remember um, when I sort of, when I first sort of clicked uh, players started watching it. I was just hooked from the first sentence. It is one of those programs where the opening scene just grabs you straight away. I was wondering if you had a similar experience reading the script. If when you did read that opening kind of monologue by your character, if you were instantly kind of compelled to see where this where, where this was sort of go on. No, my instant worry was that how in the hell at my age am I going to learn all these lines and have nobody to play off? That's just my concern. <laughs> No, but I get what you're saying. It does, because it's, it's very bold to open up a show with, and I think he, he asked me to do between 30 seconds of silence to a full minute and then would decide in the edit. So I don't know what's, whether, whether there is silence at the beginning of it or not, but that's what he wanted. So that you just, you know, down the barrel, um, not <laughs> like going to those portraits in old you know, castles where it doesn't matter where you look, or where you walk, and see the eye seem to be following you around. So that that was the that's what he wanted to achieve. So yeah, you know, I have no idea whether that's 
that's the result. Um, because I mean, it's, it's that kind of classic unreliable narrator trope. I mean, this dates back to like Edgar Allan Poe and kind of classic literature. What, what do you think it is about having that character, that kind of unreliable voice in the heart of it? Because I mean, obviously your character in some regards to begin with is, is something of a narrator, but there's a glint in his eyes and we never quite know if we trust what he's telling us. I think that, oh, I don't know, I can't get intellectual on this. My, my take on it is that since anybody was a child, they like being told a story, even if the story ends up being absolutely diabolical. But just the, that one-to-one, face-to-face um, experience you have is something that is how all stories have, have been told since the beginning of. Um, and I think that it's, I thought it was a really smart idea to, to just take that and, and say, we're not going to give you a whole lot of background and, you know, introduce all the characters. We're just bang going straight in here into the story, bugger all the introductory stuff. Um, and I like that. I think it's, it's an arresting way of starting it, from what I remember. And I love the way it introduces uh, Jason Siegel's character because in many ways it's kind of highlighting the mundanity of life. So it's him sort of walk, doing the same walk to work every day, picking up the same coffee every day from a, a coffee shop. And I'm sure when this was written, that was supposed to sort of show off a, a side of life which seemed quite trivial and sort of quite boring. But actually now that feels like such a luxury. <laughs> Huge adventure. Yeah. And I just, had to get a coffee. Yeah, and I, I was sort of watching that and the whole point of it was him saying, God, the same coffee. And I'm like, God, what? I do for macchiato from somewhere now. Um, I was wondering if uh, if you think that we maybe took those little moments in life for granted, and if you think our relationship with those the sort of mundanity of life, the kind of the walk to work or the coffee from the coffee shop, do you think we'll have a slightly different relationship with that when all of this is over? Uh, I think we might, but I think that it uh, it won't be long before everybody's back to you know, grip to their mobiles and, you know, speeding, not feeling that they have enough time to do anything. So I don't know. I think that we will wallop straight back into a very fast pace of life as soon as this pandemic is, is over. Please, God. What do you think? I mean, do you think, do you think it's going, people are going to fundamentally change? I don't know if people are going to fight. I think there might be a, a knock-on effect for a while. I think you're right. I think maybe within three or four months, it will just go back to like it always was. But, but for me personally, I feel like I'm going to have a slightly different outlook on life. And I wonder if that will be shared amongst others. But I, I, I hope well, it is. I'll, be, I'll be the guy in Starbucks, just like sort of ha the happiest man in there, just screaming for my coffee. So I'll be quite easy to spot. Um, well, if you're, born, if you're born impatient like I am, to having to go and queue you know, outside a supermarket and think, well, there's no rush for anything. And does the internet speed have to be as fast as we'd like it to be? Um, that is certainly not having a deadline of, of, of things, which, you know, my whole life seems to be, and most people I know's lives are um, run by deadlines. That will be, that'll be a readjustment. You think, well, you know, is it really worth all that? Yeah, bizarre. It's a bizarre idea to me at the moment that there might be a train leaving at a certain time that I've got to catch. Like I can't imagine <laughs> having to kind of run to the train station or anything like that. So no, exactly. that, it's going to take a while. Um, but what well, it has been good for is viewing figures, because I know that I know that I know just the, the amount of stuff that I watch. That um, I think viewing figures for all TV shows have gone through the roof as a result. You know, the Netflix one about. Uh, the Tiger King. Yeah. It was, I don't think since Dallas, in my memory, has there been a global, or certainly in the West, um, within one week, everybody, the conversation online and amongst people, you know, FaceTime and Skype and stuff was, uh, on, and WhatsApp was what was happening on that TV show. Yeah, yeah. But I was like, are you, are you managing to stay sort of creative in, in isolation? I mean, obviously, I love your with nail videos on Twitter, but I was just oh, wondering, um, because I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to know, I mean, I wonder what, I mean, I'm Andre 3000 is probably playing his electric flute, but I, I'm just yeah. interested to know kind of how creative people are managing to, to keep that spark going during this time. Well, I think you have to. And the experience for most actors is that you spend so much of your life being unemployed that, uh, you're used to you're used to you're used to having time when you're not, you know. It's it's feast or famine. It seems to be um, for actors in particular that 
you're either working every hour of the day and thinking, God, when, when will I have a break? Or it's tumbleweed thinking, you know, will I ever get another job? So in a sense, I think this, this profession has uniquely prepared my, you know, us lot for what's going on right now. And I, one of the things I have done uh, in isolation is I've watched Can You Ever Forgive Me Again? Because I just, that, I love that movie so much. I just find it oh, so profoundly you. moving and I, I just adored it. And I just took me back, I just wanted to ask you really about kind of now looking back over that experience, the kind of the Oscars, the awards season, I mean, the Barbra Streisand stuff that went on. I mean, it must have been an incredible, quite magical sort of period of your life. I never thought anything like that would happen to, to me. And... I know it will never happen again. I mean, to have begun the year with sort of uh, all these critics awards and all these nominations and winning some and losing others and then ending the year being in, you know, the final Star Wars movie was, I, I thought, you know, usually by the age of 62, most actors are sort of put out to graze. So the fact that this happened to me is as a last gasp at the singles bar was astonishing. And it was while I was there that um, wondering what I was going to do next. But Jason came and pitched me this story and I thought, oh, oh great, that, that'll keep me busy for, you know, four or five months. Um, and it did. So all of it, all of it has been bonus beyond anything that I could possibly have imagined. I mean, I might, what, that, that Star Wars experience, I mean, not just the shooting of it, but the kind of the fanfare. I mean, have you ever known anything like that? I mean, can, can anything prepare you for that sort of no. reaction to a movie? No, nothing does. Nothing does. And the, the scale of it. I mean, they closed off Hollywood Boulevard and carpeted it and made it indoors because the weather wasn't, wasn't they knew the weather, weather wasn't going to be good. Uh, it's the, the scale and the, ironically, the, the Oscar ceremony is in the Kodak Theatre and that's where the premiere was. So to be walking on stage there with all those people um, and J.J. Abrams and... Um, the people that have been there right from the beginning was out of body experience. It was amazing. So my very final question was just on to what's next. And I was looking at sort of IMDb, obviously you've got a part in, in Loki, the Marvel series. I was wondering, talking of amazing sort of new experiences, uh, firstly, if you're allowed to say how your character fits into that. And also secondly, do you have any kind of young members of the family that are really excited that sort of Uncle Richard is in a, a Marvel program or? Oh yeah, my daughter's 31 and she is very excited about that. Um, all of, all of Loki, what they've shot so far is now on standby or delay or whatever it is. So I haven't, I haven't done my stuff yet. I was supposed to have finished this Friday, um, but I haven't started. So now the next thing that I'm in is, is I play a drag queen in Everybody's Talking About Jamie, the, f the, music, the film of the musical that's on, that has been on the West End for the last three years. And you've shot that now, is that one? That has been done. Yeah. Hasn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. cool. Well, looking forward to it. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Richard. Oh, thanks good. a lot, Stefan. Yeah, and uh, enjoy okay. the rest of isolation. <laughs> All right. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, is that yeah. from the Goonies? It is indeed. Yeah. Nice. Hey!